as you saw yesterday, this is the cadre that has worked on putting this together and is doing the instruction um, for the crosscut courses. Uh, looking forward to Dave um, taking us on the journey tomorrow and into Friday and then actually Dave and Pete and Eric and I will be also involved in Friday as we sort of start to summarize what uh, what we went through this week and, and a big, big shout out to Tisha for joining us as our Zoom uh, presentation technical expert and getting us through uh, all of this. So today we're going to move down the line and deal with a few factors as we um, go through our work in the woods. We're going to talk about tension and compression. Uh, we're going to briefly talk about compound cuts and uh, some other specialty cuts. And we're going to talk about spring poles. All of this will feed into Dave's conversation about actually using the tool, um, caring for the tool, uh, putting together a cut plan, those sort of things. Um, as we go through today, our objectives are gonna be understanding forces that are gonna be applied to what it is you're cutting, what those forces are on the wood, how to make an assessment of those forces and how they may inform if you're gonna cut, which is always the first question you should ask yourself. And if you're gonna cut, um, what's the safest way in which to deal with that? Um, and what is gonna be the most efficient way to deal with that and putting together your cut uh, plan. And then we're gonna introduce the idea of compound cuts. Um, and then we're going to introduce the concept of recognizing and how to address spring poles um, as you're in the field. Compression and tension. This is where we get to the L and OLEC. Again, if you recall, O is objectives. Objective, what is your plan? What are you trying to accomplish? Probably in our case for today's sake, since we're going to talk about bucking and not felling, uh, your objective might be, for example, to uh, clear a trail corridor. Uh, H is identifying the hazards. Uh, and I would certainly stress to you that one of the hazards will be what you are cutting uh, if you're not um, effective in identifying what the challenges are gonna be. Um, and then L of course is leans or in the case of today, it's gonna be binds uh, and how that will inform your cut plan. Um, and compression and tension will also inform your escape plans as well. Um, if you have to deal with side bind uh, and side compression, um, the most well-intentioned uh, escape plan in the world may not be enough if you're not properly reading where the tension is and uh, where uh, and how much tension there is. And just a reminder, you can't, you know, you can't get to those escape plans into your cut plan without first learning how to deal with and read the tension and compression and therefore where the binds are um, in the woods. Um, you can see there we have a thinking Sawyer. That's what we want, right? If you recall from yesterday, we want to be functioning in the front of our brain. Uh, we don't want to get pulled back into bouncing between fight or flight. Um, we want to stay in that rational part of our brain that's thinking through things all the way through. Are you, are you as informed as you can be when it comes to recognizing what is uh, the project ahead of you? So where's the compression and where's the tension? I think the big questions that you have to ask yourself, um, and I think the first one is always, what is gravity doing to the fibers on this tree that we need to remove from the trail corridor? <clears throat> Where is the pressure uh, that gravity is applying and what is that doing to compress the fibers? And what is that doing to add tension to the fibers? Um, sometimes overlooked, is, overlooked is, is there something twisting the fibers? Um, I know of a very skilled sea sawyer uh, running a chainsaw in a hurry, um, didn't realize that the crown of the tree had rolled when the tree came down, um, was running the chainsaw instead of a crosscut saw, so couldn't hear the tension speaking to him. Um, and the next thing he knew, he was on the ground with a compound tip fib fracture. Um, and when he got out of the hospital and came back weeks later, the tree he cut had come his direction 84 inches. So again, binds, uh, the, the compression will grab your saw, but the tension can hurt you. Um, and so twisting fibers is one example 
of what we deal with with compression. Um, and is there anything torquing the fibers? Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate these things in a minute, so don't worry. You're going to hopefully see some examples of that. But is there is there something that's causing the the fibers that would normally be running straight to be under some sort of pressure? Um, and then one that I think sometimes is overlooked is anything actually pulling at the fibers. Uh, best example I can give to you here is you might have gravity working on one end if you've got the crown suspended on a tree in in one direction, but it's still attached. Uh, to the root ball, and that root ball may be wanting to settle back in. That's further stretching the fibers on the top of the log. Uh, it would obviously uh, allow for a top cut, as we'll get into later, but it also means there may be incredible tension on the top of that. Um, and then how do we assess where, where those pressures may be applied that's creating compression and tension uh, on the buck that we need to cut to open the trail in this case? There is no hurry when making an assessment. Um, I like to say you walk, you talk, you think, and you discuss. Um, if at all possible, you should walk the full length of what you're about to cut. You should be able to see if it's still attached at the stump. You should be able to see what the crown is doing. Uh, you know, One example of a force being applied to a crown might be that the crown is in a river and the river is putting that sort of force downstream on one side of the, of the log because of the crown being suspended in the water. Um, but if you can walk all the way around uh, the buck that you're about to cut to get an idea of what may be going on, talk to your crew, have somebody give you the perspective on the other side, what they're seeing. Uh, you're looking for places where, where you may assume that it's suspended and, you, and somebody on the other side can see that there is uh, one of the branches is impaled in the ground and actually that's what's holding the weight and that's going to completely change where the compression and where the tension is. So have somebody talk you through the uh, from the other side, do that walk around and then think, is this an old burned snag that just finally came down after 10 years and it's been settled there on the trail for days? Or in the couple examples I have for you here, um, is this fresh down? Are there, is there still likely lots of what I will call fresh tension on the wood because the tree is still settling? The tree was a standing um, tree just days before. This example on the left is the Appalachian Trail, um, and the big laurel branch wilderness on the Cherokee, and the one on the right. Um, if Scotty B's here again today, he'll recognize that as the, an AT shelter in the Pond Mountain Wilderness. Uh, and uh, also on the Cherokee National Forest in Tennessee. Both of these were after major, a uh, major Derecio uh, wind event. Um, and if you get to these quick, which a lot of times trail clubs and hikers and equestrians want us to get to these things quick, you're getting to them when there's still a dynamic going on um, uh, of settling and that sort of thing. So think through how long has this been here? Uh, what else could be going on and discuss uh, what people are seeing, but don't walk up and immediately pull out the saw. And by that, I even mean your pocket saw. It, it, it is tempting to jump in uh, and start trying to clear some of the smaller stuff so that you can get a full view. And eventually you will have to do that. But you need to think about if any of that fiber is under tension, uh, because that tension, again, is what can hurt or possibly kill you. So walk, talk, think, and discuss. All right, so let's talk about the pressures. This is the, the uh, demonstration part of that, and I am going to stop share real quick. Um, so this is new, everybody. Um, uh, trying this virtual to teach a saw course, but this is going to be our log for today. I'll try to stand back far enough where you all can see that. So for today, this pool noodle is the buck that we need to cut out of the trail that's blocking our trail corridor. And I'm gonna go through some of the scenarios that you can um, experience so that maybe you can get an idea on how that compression and tension is working and what it might be doing. So there's a couple of standard scenarios. One is the log is laying flat on the ground all the way around, you walk around, then you're sort of dealing with sort of what I would consider neutral compression and tension, though there might be still 
some residual compression on the top, tension on the bottom. You have a scenario where you come up where the log is laying and suspended. And therefore you've got gravity working on this side. And when you have that, you have top tension and bottom compression. Everybody, I hope that's making sense to everybody. Carol, if you get any feedback there, let me know. Um, and then you got a scenario where either end of the log is on the ground and you get gravity working the middle. And therefore you end up with top compression and bottom tension. Just making sense, I hope to everybody. So again, if you get a suspended weight, you're gonna get tension on the top, compression on the bottom. If you've got either end sitting on the ground and the middle suspended, you've got gravity doing its thing in the middle and creating the compression on the top and the tension on the bottom. Then what about a scenario where we get a log that has fallen between two trees and it's like this. This is where we get um, into side tension and side compression and the release could come right at you if you're on the wrong side and you haven't read that that's why you do this full walk around and you know and sometimes you'll notice that a tree is falling between those two and that noodle is um or that tree is um sort of twisted and torqued right so we're dealing with that and we have to think about how much tension is there Where's the compression and what are we gonna do about releasing that? So this is our noodle, right? This is our tree from the day. I'm trying to think of anything else I wanna cover. Um, we will get a scenario where we have just compression all the way around, which is a log maybe sitting at a pretty steep elevation and just all of the fibers are being compressed. <clears throat> right? And we're just dealing sort of compression everywhere. Again, I wanna bring up the stop scenario where you look and you think this tree is suspended and you think what you've got is top tension and bottom uh, compression, but then you realize that you've actually got a stop stuck in the ground out here and this tree has actually um, switched it around on you. And, and I promise you, you do this long enough, you're gonna realize that you're gonna get tension and compression right maybe 75% of the time, but Occasionally, you're going to get it wrong. There's just things. I gave the example of the Sawyer I know that ended up with a broken leg. He just didn't realize that the crown of the tree had um, had basically twisted as it came down and created that twisting motion or that twisting action in the fibers of the tree. So, no, we have one question. Him. Sure. It says, can you talk about the intersection of twisting and tension compression? How does a twist factor into the dynamic forces? Well, it's a good question. Twisting is, 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 as you can imagine, just the dynamic of all of the fibers are being twisted and the release is going to go, uh, this is, these are the ones that are sort of hard to figure out is which way is, it, is, the, is the tree actually twisted, but, as you start to cut, you know, one of the best ways to, to analyze whether you have gotten the tension and compression read correct is what does your curve do? What does your cut do to tell you what's going on? Um, and it can, it'll tell you by whether it's opening or actually starting to pinch or bind the saw. It'll tell you by, by literally the actions of the fibers. And so you just, you really, with when it comes to twisting, and I'm Pete, I'd be curious, or Dave, uh, what you got, how you guys would answer that question. But with, with sort of that twisting action, you've sort of got to get started with the cut. You have to make your best guesstimate of which side those, the tension and compression is on. But in the case of twisting, sometimes the, the tension is almost everywhere. Pete, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, I think you got it exactly right there, um, Bill. And until you put the saw in and you start um, watching the kerf, you don't know 100% where, where the, the tension is or the compression. And twists um, throw a whole different aspect to it. If the wood has cracked as it came down, if, it's, if the tree is split, it could have multiple um, tension locations of tension and compression in, in the same cut. So you just have to go slow and listen and, and watch. 
Yeah, one of the things, hey, Dave, you want to go ahead? Unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, so the way I handle um, that rotational force, that twisting force, is to, um, I, I generally like to put in a, a very minor compound cut across the fiber and in the direction um, opposite the way I think it's going to twist. Uh, so that way your cut will open as opposed to closing. If you cut directly across the fiber, uh, no matter where you put your saw, you will get pinched in those yeah. situations. So. so that way you're basically validating if you've got the twisting action right, um, is what Dave's saying there. He's cutting, he's making a compound cut, which we'll cover a little bit more, but best as I can, I'll demonstrate this. If this twisting action is doing this, Dave is going to try to cut across the twist here to see if he's correct. Am I getting that right, Dave, the way you're saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions on that before we move along? <clears throat> so again, we're paying attention to the pressure that gravity is putting onto it the pressure of any torque that's being applied because it's fallen maybe between two trees. Uh, it, could between, it could be between a boulder and a tree. It could be just the way the crown settled. We're paying attention to any twisting action that potentially could be going on uh, because of the way the crown uh, has moved or the way the buck is, itself has maybe moved as it came down. Um, and again, the pulling action, the, the best example I can give to you again, if this is our log and we've got gravity on one end and we've got a tree still attached uh, to the root ball at the other end. Gravity's pulling pressure on the fiber, but that root ball, and I've had this happen multiple times, that root ball uh, is also pulling up that tree. That root ball is wanting to settle back down into that hole. Um, and, and it's not just that we need to know where the tension is and where the compression is, but we need to have an idea of how much tension is there. I, I like to always tell our staff what we want to strive for is a non-dramatic release. What we're hoping for is that when we cut through the fibers and we're done and that buck releases that it's not dramatic. It's not always possible, but if you're paying attention, uh, it might be possible. I've had um, a ton of tension here and the, as soon as you lay the teeth of that saw, into the fibers, it'll start to tell you that there's a tremendous amount of tension. Um, and there's a hazard for how you get the work done that can come from that, which is causing the tree to barber chair, um, which would be splitting along the grain um, because there's so much tension that you cut to a certain point and the, the log will just split long ways. Um, and then there's also just the fact that it may do that. Um, when, you, when it releases that root ball may stand back up that tree may roll. And so you want to be able to read that. And I think this is, there's a variety of ways in which a chainsaw is a safer tool. And there's a variety of ways in which a crosscut is a safer tool. I think the biggest example of uh, the way in which a crosscut saw is a, is a slightly safer tool is that we could hear, uh, we're not uh, impaired in being able to hear the tension. Uh, the tree will talk to you if it's under a great deal of tension. You'll you'll see it in the curve, but you'll also hear it um, in the splintering and the and the tearing of the fibers in the woods. So right, that's that's the tension and compression that's going on in the wood. So with the compression and tension, how do we adapt to the bind? Um, on the compression side is what we would call the bind. That's uh, the piece that again will grab your saw. Uh, but not necessarily the side that's going to hurt you. The tension side, the release side um, is where you have to pay attention, where you have to know where you need to be. Um, and again, tension equals danger. Uh, tension, if you have a side bind, if again you have a, a log that is jammed between two trees and you've got side bind, you need to make sure that you're not going to finish that cut on the side in which the tension, the energy is wanting to release. Um, I will say cutting into the tension has its downsides. And I just gave you an example of one of those um, is if there is so much tension, uh, the chair, the, the buck can barber chair um, that that also is going to then throw off uh, and potentially change where the tension and compression are. 
on the tree. It's also making it make it going to be impossible to potentially finish the cut with the curve you started. Um, and so it's it's an oversimplification to say that we're always going to be cutting into the tension. That's not always the case, uh, and particularly if there is a, a tremendous amount of force being applied on the tension side. Um, twisting fibers, as Dave referenced uh, earlier, can also bind as well. It's not just where there's compression, because there will be compression everywhere if the fibers are being twisted. And as I mentioned earlier, you never want to finish on the tension side. Is this making sense to you all? Is this bringing up any questions? I don't want to keep racing through this if you guys want me to slow down or cover something a little bit further. Anything, Carol? No, nope. I'm not seeing anything more. Um, good explanation. Don't be don't be afraid to put questions in the chat or in the question and answer panel. Um, everybody liked your noodle, and somebody said a go light teaching aid for the backcountry classroom. That's exactly right. It is super light, super easy, and it becomes a playful toy too, um, and it'll keep you afloat. Um, you can cut into the compression, as I mentioned. Uh, it may not be uh, either advantageous or even safe to cut into the tension um, and you can cut into the compression side uh, if the compression is uh, not too severe. Uh, if you can get your saw in far enough, you can take advantage of using wedges. Again, some of this you're gonna, uh, Dave is gonna put into demonstration later in the week. And obviously this is stuff that's gonna become more natural to you um, if you're a first time Sawyer to, to be able to figure out how much compression is there. Can you get the saw in long, far enough to drive wedges? So that the wedges can keep uh, keep the curve open, so it doesn't grab your saw. So I see a couple um, of questions coming up. Yeah, there's questions know. popping up, Bill. Um, you said never finish on the tension side. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, particularly if you're running a two man saw, um, there's somebody on each side of the buck. If you've got, I'm going to stop share again real quick. Um, oh, sorry. If you've got, if you've got a buck, I'm going to try to use my chair as an example here. If you've got a buck that has been jammed between two logs, and as you start to make your cut, you realize that the curve's opening on one side and wanting to close on the other, or you've read it ahead of time and you realize that there is compression. If you all can, uh, let's try to back up. You all can see this better. Maybe bring my chair up. All right, we'll do it here. Do it a little bit higher for you guys. If you've got a buck that has been wedged between two trees or something is creating the fibers to be stretched on one side, the tension side, and compressed on the other side, but your only choice is to cut it across from the top or from the bottom, either under buck or top buck, there is a tremendous amount of energy that wants to be released in a certain direction, and it's gonna be in the direction of the tension, and that you don't want to leave a Sawyer on that side, because if you do, that's gonna happen. When this, if I was willing to cut up my pool noodle, it would actually spring open that direction, and you don't want somebody there. So one way would be to put together a cut plane where you don't have to do it at all, but a lot of times that's not possible. So what you can do is finish with a Sawyer on the compression side, take the handle off the other side and finish it, depending on how much, how much tension it's under. Maybe it's just the last few strokes, maybe it's the last third of the buck that you can finish uh, with just one Sawyer on what I would call the safe side of the buck. Thanks, Bill. There's one more question. Could you explain the term barber chair a little more? Yeah, actually this pool noodle might be able to help me there a little bit. It's not split all the way, but y'all can see there is a slit down this one because this I actually use for protecting a bicycle on a rack. But um, barber chair would be, if you're cutting through tremendous amount of tension on the top, so I'm folding this down so y'all can see there. If you're, if you're cutting down through the top because you are cutting through the tension, um, if there is so much tension, if you get a certain point in there, the fibers are going to be under so much pressure that this will split this way. And the top half of the log will spring up because it's under so much tension pulling it up. 
Um, so that's what Barbatar is, is where part of the buck releases as, as opposed to the whole thing releasing together. Right, I think we've grabbed all the questions now, Bill. Okay. So again, oh, this was an example of actually having to cut into the compression. Um, I think all of us would agree um, on the panel here that um, top bucking is the easier way to work. Gravity works with your saw as opposed to against it. Uh, and so if there's not a tremendous amount of compression on the top, uh, you can cut in if you can get it in far enough to be able to get your kerf stabilized by driving some wedges in it. So where do you begin? Well, obviously we begin with the walk around, right? We've, uh, we know what our objective is. We wanna open this trail corridor. We've identified um, the hazards, um, whether they're overhead or on the ground, maybe they're weather, maybe they're uh, the critters. Um, and then certainly there's the hazard of what you're cutting uh, itself. But you wanna start by looking at what is the plan? What do we want to actually accomplish? And that's gonna maybe depend on what the trail management objectives are for the trail, how wide of a corridor you need to create. Do you wanna cut the buck wide enough that you don't have to worry about it ever settling back into the trail? Where do you want the buck that you cut out to go? You know, where you're gonna to have to get it out of the trail. You can't just drop it in the trail. You actually wanna get it out of the trail corridor. And depending on the size of that buck, the, the physics of moving that might be significant so that you may want to actually give yourself an advantage of how to move it, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute with compound cuts. Um, you know, in this scenario here, you could have any number of things going. You might, you might have top tension, bottom compression, because this looks like this is suspended out here. But then this branch is coming up here is up against this log. So this um, branch of this tree might actually have some side bind on it and side tension. Um, which should we get rid of first? Do we have to cut this limb off first? And we, in this particular case, it looks like the energy may want to go towards the Sawyer on the other side. And so it might be a cut that you would finish on this side or just do as a single buck on this side. But you talk through the whole process. And you also want to talk through the process of what you make, what might be a multiple cut um, plan. And most times they are, sometimes you can have one cut, but lots of times you're cutting out uh, either side of the trail corridor and getting rid of the buck. What's going to happen to the tree once you safely cut the first buck out? Is it going to change suddenly from a nice clean top buck scenario to a difficult underbuck where you may not even be able to get the saw in the bottom, but there might be so much compression on the top. You got to talk through all those sort of things as you're thinking about what's the current pressures on the wood and what are going to be the pressures once we start making specific cuts that are part of our cut plan. Let's talk a little bit about compound cuts. We haven't really talked about just the straight perpendicular curve across the wood. Um, Dave did talk a little bit about cutting with the twist in the case of sort of a twisting bind. But I want to give you a couple um, examples of some compound cuts here. Um, thanks to Pete for this graphic. This, um, this illustration on the top is sort of what our standard cut would be. Our standard cut is going to be cutting perpendicular to the fibers, cutting across the fibers whether you're cutting from the top in the case of top tension bottom bind or cutting from the bottom with bottom tension and top bind. Um, this is generally what you're going to do, but there are reasons to do these compound cuts and they can happen um, in a variety of angles. Uh, they can cut, they can be cut um, sort of up and down or side to side, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, it might be that you want to, in this case of this middle example, um, you're cutting at a slight angle so that it's going to allow the buck to release and that you maybe want to cut those angles in a way that allows it to re release in the direction you want to go. You should always have a plan for where is the ultimate destination for that buck. Um, and if it's, hey, there's a spot over here, it's going to be downhill once we get it on the ground, it'll be easier for the crew to, to find a way to move it. Um, and so you can set it up that way. It also may be that you want that buck to drop and roll in a certain direction because if it comes the other way, it's going to be coming at a Sawyer. 
um, if it starts immediately to take off because of gravity. Uh, and so these compound cuts will make your, your life a whole lot simpler. Um, I think Scotty uh, Bowman is in this course just getting a refresher and Scotty and I um, had the chance to work on some pretty dramatic um, complex situations in the flat side wilderness in Arkansas. And one thing I will caution you about with the compound cuts is those angles do not need to be dramatic. Um, they just need to be a little bit of an angle. If you make it too dramatic, you're basically ripping the wood and you're going to exhaust yourself. So by that, I mean, if this is our standard cut and it's going perpendicular to the fibers, that compound cut doesn't need to be this. It maybe just needs to be that. Because if you get into a steep compound cut, you're basically ripping the, the buck instead of cutting the fibers. And um, it's just an exhausting proposition. Um, and then this offset cut, uh, is an important one if you want to save your saw. Um, this is uh, uh, a way in which to finish uh, a cut where you know there's going to be a fairly significant release and gravity is going to be pulling one side down. You put your offset on the, on the buck that you do not expect to move, uh, on the side of the cut you do not expect to move, so that when the fibers do finally give way, that there's a pocket that your saw is sitting in there and so that, that the buck that does the piece of your buck that does fall um, does not take your saw with it into the ground and uh, bend, twist, or break um, your saw. So that's an example of, of using that. Uh, another cut that's not demonstrated here that I think is fairly important, and this goes back to the barber chair question. If you know you have a lot of tension um, in a certain direction, but that you're going to have to cut in the tension, um, for the most part, you should still start cutting into the compression. Um, and that sometimes will stop that barber chair from happening. If there's not so much compression that you can't get started on the compression side, you should go in, honestly, uh, uh, at least three or four inches or, or two, a uh, third to, to half of the buck if you can get the saw in without getting it bound because that will alleviate the tension wanting to barber chair the log. So if we know we've got severe top tension bottom bind, we may still start with an underbuck just to sever some of the fibers on the bottom so that when the tree does decide to go, it doesn't go down the length of the grain. It just actually will go together. So Pete, no. Dave, anything you wanna add there? Or Carol, you got a question? Yep. Um, let's go back to the offset cut. Would you make the top or underbuck first? I, I would make the underbuck first. I think it depends on the scenario. Um, but I mean, you're going to make the underbuck first. Um, I'm sorry, you're going to make the underbuck second, saying that backwards. Um, you're going to cut from the top. Um, but probably what in this scenario might be happening is there's a, a pretty good chance that the kerf is going to start to close and bind here if you're coming in from the top. And so you get as far in as you can uh, and get the saw out before you get it bound. And then you're gonna finish with the offset cut coming from the underbuck in that scenario. Cause then your saw is gonna be sitting in this pocket right here. If your saw is sitting here, the buck's gonna drop and it's gonna pinch your saw. Uh, but if you're sitting right here, this buck's just gonna drop away and leave, uh, hopefully if you put your offset cut. And this is a, this is a tricky, distance here it's it's if it's too much the fibers will just continue to hold these fibers that are still not severed here uh, but if it's too close this the buck dropping may actually pull the saw with you thanks bill yep dave repeat anything you guys want to add to that yeah this is pete i don't have anything i think you've covered everything pretty well yeah, great. Here's an example of a compound cut. You can see the angles here. We've had lots of scenarios where you do both cuts and the buck just won't release at all because there's still uh, a lot of times maybe compression coming from both sides because the, the log might be at an angle. Um, but you want to give yourself the ability to get that um, to get that buck out of the out of the cut. So when the bind or the lean points you back to the hazard, uh, this is that example I showed you guys earlier. This is um, 
a series of trees that have been dropped uh, in and around this AT shelter, which was grandfathered into this wilderness called the Pond Mountain Wilderness on the Cherokee. Um, so an administrative site, uh, have to sort of deal with hazards. The shelter was closed. I will tell you the AT crowd is a bunch that tends to use things even when they say close. So the sooner we could address all the safety hazards that this created, the better. Um, but in the case here, we went in once and realized some of this stuff was not going to be safe to do with the saw. Um, you got all sorts of things going. You got a rather major uh, tree right here that's barely uh, landed on the back of the shelter. You've got things that are potential spring poles, which we're going to talk about in a minute. You got something here that looks like it's got a lot of tension on it, which is actually turns out to be this right here. And in this particular case, in the end, to cut or to get rid of this hazard, we decided the saw was not the safest tool and actually the grip hoist was the safest tool. There was enough of the tree broken off that we thought we could put enough pressure on it that the fibers would tear and that's ultimately what happened. <clears throat> As you walk up on that scenario, um, the temptation sometimes is to grab, grab the old folding saw and just start trying to get down to see what you can see, but you never know what's under tension. And it does not take something of significant size to be under so much tension that it can not hurt uh, somebody. Um, and so doing that walk around before you even pull the pocket saw, you know, out of your pack, uh, certainly before you unsheath the crosscut saw or start swinging an ax is to get an idea of what is all going on and what is gonna be the plan and the first plan might be, how are we gonna get down to actually seeing the main trunk um, and what our cut plan for that is gonna be and how we're gonna do that safely. Um, and when we're talking about tension, we're not just looking out for ourselves. If we're gonna have swampers working with us, they need to be aware that you're cutting into something that might be under tension. So again, in this case, the bind um, pointed us back to, to uh, thinking about the hazards of the task at hand and how to get it done. So it's gonna be sort of hard to just show these spring poles, but I'll, I'll break out my old handy dandy uh, pool noodle here again in a second. But as we get into some of these freshly down scenarios, you get what we call spring poles. Um, it might be that as a larger tree came down, it uh, grabbed a young tree with it and just bolted it over. This is not a perfect example because this already started to break up here. But if this hadn't broken, imagine this is a relatively small green sapling right here. And this big complex of trees that came down has pulled that down. That is a spring pole. May not be quite a classic spring pole, but that is a spring pole. There is some tension going on here. If these two pieces were still attached, there would be a whole lot of tension going on here. Um, and that tension can hurt you, not just when you cut it, but if you ignore that and you start cutting what is actually holding one end of it down, uh, you could inadvertently release that at a difficult time. So you have to deal with these spring poles. Pete, you wanna hop in here? Yeah, um, do you just wanna to touch on the freshness of, of um, the spring pole and, and how much energy? Um, yeah. With, go ahead. Yeah, it's sort of back to my comment earlier about the, the trees that we were dealing with at that shelter um, or on the Appalachian Trail. Sometimes these trails, even in wilderness areas get get uh, get a response that wants us to get out there right away after a storm event, for example. You know, let's say versus a scenario where, you know, 10 years after a fire, we start having trees come down here in the bob. Um, and if that is a fresh, um, fresh complex of trees that are down, if that tree is, uh, if that green sapling, sapling, in this case, this looks like this has been down and dead for a while, but if this had, you know, three days earlier was a standing live tree, there is a lot of fiber that's still very uh, um, under a tremendous amount of tension. And so if you walk on this scenario five years after it's fallen, that tension is going to change. But if it's a day or two after the storm, um, there is a tremendous amount. There's been no release of the fibers through decay or anything. So is that what you want me to get at, Pete? Yeah, that's that's perfect. Um, yeah. You know, five years down the line, 
there may be nothing in there that that tree may be quote petrified in that or or um frozen in that in that um that arc but yeah any anywhere you know up to a year it can still hold a lot of a lot of tension a lot of energy yeah and so yeah. carol do you have something yep if you could just reiterate um is it a general rule and is it accurate that the first cut is on the compression side no it's not a general rule the general rule is that you need to try to know where the tension is and where the compression is um, it is much more likely that you're gonna to wanna to cut on the tension side. If that tension is not dramatic or if that tension is not uh, pointed in a direction that might injure somebody in the operation. So if that, if that energy is going up, if, we've, if, you've got, um, if you've got a scenario where there is a, a suspended weight on one end, if you've got the crown suspended and gravity is doing its thing, you're more than likely gonna to wanna to cut into that tension as long as that's not dramatic tension uh, and that nobody's ever like leaning over that tension as you're cutting, you know, somebody's leaning over to drive a wedge when there's something under tremendous amount of tension. But there are times when you're gonna cut into the compression because you just have to. Um, and there are times when you're gonna to have to maybe cut into some severe tension because you have to but that's gonna be a product of your skill level. Uh, and I'm gonna sort of go back to some of the slides that, that Pete had yesterday about understanding the complexity of what you're making and is it above your ability to stay in the front of your brain? You know, is it above your skills as a Sawyer to be able to process the way to handle that? But no, there are, there are times when you have no choice but to cut into the compression. Uh, if, you, if you want an ideal scenario, you, you know, I don't know if there is an ideal scenario, but an ideal scenario is a little bit of top tension and bottom bind because top bucking physically is an easier process, both from a muscle memory perspective and then just physical exhaustion because the gravity of <laughs> works with the saw and you're cutting through tension. So the curve, the, the cut is gonna wanna open with you. Um, but I would tell you more times than not, you don't have an ideal scenario. You'll have both ends of the tree on the ground and you've got it like this and you've got severe top compression and if you try to cut into that it might bind your saw as soon as you start cutting through the fibers uh, and before you could ever dream of getting a wedge in it and so in that scenario you're talking about underbucking you're you're cutting into the tension uh, and not into the compression so you know the easier operation is cutting into the tension because the curve is going to work with you and not against you but you have to you have to sort of deal with what the scenario throws at you well, just a time check. You're about halfway through. And in the chat, there's a lot of appreciation for your discussion and your answers. So thank you. Okay, great. So I want to talk about how to deal with these spring poles um, for a minute. So this is now our spring pole, as much as I can bend this pool noodle. And so what we have here is, is sort of a classic spring pole scenario, right? And I want to caution you, this is not just at pulling down green saplings. This can be a branch on the tree that fell uh, that has gotten um, a lot of times a, a branch will dig into the ground, but the, the finish of the momentum of the of gravity pulling down on the log will create that kind of tension this way. But let's, let's think about the classic spring pole where a log coming down, a tree coming down has pulled down a, a smaller green tree um, and you get this, um, the spring pole action going on where there's a really what I would almost call violent tension going on. Again, if you release it wrong, that's what's gonna happen. And I know somebody um, in region eight that got severely hurt and had to retire because of a spring pole. Um, and so how are we gonna deal with this? What are we gonna deal with this? This is where you do not wanna cut into the tension. This is where you are gonna cut into the compression. And it's gonna be hard for me to demonstrate this with both hands, but Let's assume that you guys can visualize that this is still under this sort of scenario. You're gonna get out uh, whichever saw works or whichever ax works and you can shave with an ax or you can do it with a hand saw or whatever. But again, this is like this. You're gonna actually make a series of cuts into the compression at the apex of where that tension is, right? Sort of if you can imagine where the maximum amount of tension is, but you're gonna sort of work your way 
up to it, through it, and beyond it. And then you're going to come back through and just doing slow, shallow cuts. And what's going to happen, and this pool noodle won't do it, is that spring pole is going to slowly fold in half. What we're not trying to do is release the energy going out with the tension. We're wanting to slowly release the energy to where this just folds over in half. And it does it very gradually. And if you just do a series of small cuts, um, again, into the compression in this scenario, this is definitely where you want to be into the compression, no matter how much you think you can stand back and cut into that tension. You don't know which way that tension may want to go when those fibers finally release. So did that make sense? Did that generate any questions? There is a question. Um, going back to that one scene you had with the cabin, it says some scenarios where you need to consider rigging in saw operations are grip hoists something you regularly bring with you? Uh, if you've got pack stock, maybe. Um, um, and I'm not being as I'm not being a smart aleck. I could just um, a grip hoist is not um, not a small. Oops, sorry, went the wrong way. Um, it's not a small consideration when you think about the weight and that sort of thing. In this particular case, this was about two miles from a trailhead. We'd gone in once and realized that some of this was not going to be cut. So it's not, I wouldn't say the grip hoist is standard equipment for saw operations, but when needed, it is certainly handy. Thank you. Yeah, we had to deal with, you know, this being on this, this, rather large trunk was actually on part of the shelter. Uh, this is actually sort of the front of the shelters right here. This is this is the opening of the, it's a three-sided classic AT trail shelter. Um, and then you had this broken snag just right in front of the shelter. And again, it doesn't matter how much tape you put up and you say the shelter is closed, they're still gonna stay there. Uh, eventually you have to deal with it. And so in this particular case, it was, we thought this was the safest way to bring this down. If we had tried to, sort of fell this tree from here, it's a crapshoot on what's gonna happen when this releases with this severely broken piece. And then you had this tree that was coming up from the back here. And we were literally in scenarios where we had to consider cutting while standing on the roof of the shelter, that sort of thing. <clears throat> no one follow-up. Um, someone has yeah. a wilderness trail with a series of these spring poles concentrated in half a mile area. Um, the Sawyers think it's easier to address these poles using chainsaws. Is there an advantage to cross cut versus chainsaw in that kind of situation? Oh my God, you just set me up for my stump speech. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for teeing me up for my stump speech here. Um, the tool tools uh, have an inherent advantage. Um, uh, chainsaws, um, the moment you're standing there making the cut, I'm not going to be foolish and try to argue with you that a crosscut saw is faster than a chainsaw. It's not. But what is lost is if we, if all we think about is that segment of time is that what I would call the last 2% of the energy it took to get to the point where we're uh, cutting the stuff out of the trail, uh, then we're missing the point because most of the energy went to certifying Sawyers, recruiting volunteers, hiring force account crews, getting them to the trailhead, getting them 10 miles into the wilderness to where this complex of blowdowns might be. That's where all the work is. And so the solution is a manpower solution and not a horsepower solution. Again, I'm not gonna sit here and argue that there aren't efficiencies in a chainsaw, but the Wilderness Act is not about efficiencies. It's, it's about humility. Um, it doesn't mean that, that I've been opposed to every scenario where a chainsaw has been authorized. If, if there's a if there's a hazard tree that's standing above uh, an administrative site in the wilderness, and it's a serious concern about how long crosscut sawyers would be in the danger zone, standing there at the trunk, uh, making a cut versus maybe a smaller amount of time in the danger zone for a, a chainsaw operation. But there's obviously a process not to get into it in this class, a minimum requirements analysis where we would say that the chainsaw was the minimum tool to do that operation that had to be done safely. Um, but I think we have these rushes to chainsaws. The example I would give you is uh, Hurricane Irma in about 2017, uh, hit North Georgia in um, September uh, on a Tuesday morning. And by Friday, by Friday, 
some members of the Appalachian Trail community were screaming for chainsaw use in the seven wilderness areas that the AT passes through on the Chattahoochee in North Georgia. There were parts of Georgia that still didn't have power um, that um, and yet we were already making this argument that the only way we were going to get these trails open and we had to get them open because there might be some southbound through hikers coming through. And I'm not picking on the AT community. It's, it was just, we, we sort of get in this idea of convenience. Um, and, and in their case, they thought it would be convenient to be able to use chainsaws when I actually thought the first reaction would be, what are the resources that we can deploy, the human resources that we can deploy to address the situation. And that trail was open within 10 to 14 days because of agency personnel adding some pay periods to some Sawyers actually from out West here. And when they went to Georgia, they jumped into part of it. Uh, Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards jumped in and did a part of it. Um, and in that case, I don't, I don't think it would have happened any faster with chainsaws. Uh, again, 98% of the work is getting to the point where you're standing there making your cut plan. Um, and so that's my answer to that. Um, you know, we live in a world of chocolate and vanilla. Some people may have a different opinion, but um, that's that's my view on that. Thanks, Bill. I think that's all the questions for now. So again, Pete's uh, presentation yesterday talked about thinking Sawyers um, and pausing uh, long enough to think about, uh, have you gone through OLEC? Have you identified what your objective is for the day. In this case, it's opening this trail. Um, have you identified all of the potential hazards? Um, have you thought about liens, or in this case, binds, and what that may do uh, to how your cut plan will come together? Um, then you move on to thinking about your escape plans. But we want to create thinking Sawyers that, that can stay in that front of the brain headspace, right? Um, you figure out how complex the situation is. Um, and sometimes the safest operation is the operation you don't do. Um, if it, if at all, you start to feel that this is over my head, I, I understand the, the drive that may come from that you've hiked your crew in. It's actually what you had planned for the day. You've come in three and a half miles to do this. And now you've seen what has been reported and it, it might be over your skill as the lead Sawyer, it might be over the skill of the Sawyers that you have with you. Uh, and it is quite okay to walk away from that. Having a trail blocked for a few more days is, is not worth um, jumping into the uh, fight or flight um, part of your brain and trying to do things that, that you're not quite sure what the outcome is gonna be, right? Um, and so you need to think about those things in this matrix that Pete put together and showed you yesterday, the, you know, is, is it a, is it a low complexity scenario? Is it pretty straightforward? Is it a, uh, you know, two or three trees laying across the trail that you can put together a, a pretty easy to identify cut plan based on how you've read where the compression and tension is, that you have safe escape routes for where you'll be cutting from. Um, you've identified all those sort of hazards. And so um, those are the sort of things to think about, but, but today, mostly I wanted to make sure you guys started to think about, those of you who have not done this before, what compression and tension is, what it does to, uh, and how it will inform the stuff that Dave's going to be presenting tomorrow, maybe a little bit into Friday, um, on how you put together your cut plan, how the tool actually functions, how it works. That, that's going to be important as you think about tension and you think about actually how the teeth and the rakers work. So. Um, and with that, I'm open to more questions, more conversation. I know we've got about 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And so there's um, just a comment of appreciation as an AT through hiker. It's so rewarding to work and see this side of things. Um, so appreciative of that discussion. And a question about SAW certificates that expired during the pandemic. Are they still valid? Um, and just a comment that a substitute for the pool noodle, think foam insulation for hot water pipes. Um, oh, that's great. Idea different diameters, um, extra padding for straps in a pinch into the back program, so yeah. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's great. Um, didn't ever thought, think I would be teaching CrossCut Saw with Pool Noodle, but uh, uh, here I am, and actually I think some of you are right. This is actually gonna be a, a tool that's functional even when we're beyond Zoom and uh, back in person. This is 
Uh, and I like the idea of the, in the foam insulation for, for water pipes because this is not quite as flexible as maybe I wanted it to be to demonstrate uh, spring poles as an example, but yeah, absolutely. The and Pete, uh, Pete, 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 people, people, you want to, Pete, you want to answer that question? I think saw certifications were were extended to October of this year. Is that right? It, yes, we have a interim directive out um, in policy that extends um, expired saw qualifications. Any saw qualification that expired in, um, from October 2019 through um, uh, September 30th of 2021 um, are still valid. And, and, and currently there is no plan for an extension to that, that waiver. Okay. Uh, Kim, I saw your comment. Yeah, if, if you did, so if I did color some of these, that's a great idea. You could color in for those of you who, who teach or are gonna be teaching, maybe using a Sharpie on this when you make the bends would demonstrate the tension. I think you guys, Get it, but that would certainly exaggerate showing you where the fibers are pulling apart. That's a great idea. Okay, another one. If the situation is one of low complexity, would two A Sawyers be permitted to work without a B Sawyer being present? Pete, question. Pete, you want to grab that one? I'm sorry, I was on uh, on mute. Uh, yeah, could you write? The question is, can two, yeah, can two A Sawyers work without a B present? No, um, yeah. current policy says that um, an A Sawyer must be supervised by a higher level Sawyer, so a B or a C. Any other questions? I saw there was a question about uh, trainings in the Pacific Northwest, I think I saw in the chat. Um, yeah, northwestern regions this summer or fall. I, um, Stephen, I'll I'll look into that. I'm sure that there are whether like the Mount Adams Institute maybe holds a training that would be open to other folks. Um, I know several of the backcountry horseman chapters in the state of Washington. I'm sure have saw trainings that might be open to non-members of the clubs. Um, uh, the Siskiyou Mountain Club down in Southern Oregon, I think, probably has a crosscut class that might be open. Um, but that's certainly something, Stephen, as you're doing your work, if this is the Stephen, I think it is, you could reach out to Nancy Taylor and she might be able to connect you where those trainings, where those trainings are. Um, okay, there was... Any tips on how to make a smoother process when you're talking about underbucking, which is awkward and cumbersome? I think Dave's going to handle underbucking uh, in the next couple of days. Um, uh, when we were sort of planning some of these sessions, we were talking about some of the standard um, pitfalls of underbucking that people fall into. Um, about the the stroke is obviously different from from top bucking, but also how you finish the stroke is different. The tendency of of when you're top bucking. Uh, when you're in a really good rhythm, you're pulling up at the very end of your stroke. And when you're underbucking, you actually want to do the opposite because if you start pulling up at the end of your stroke, you're actually gonna grab the edge of the curve with the rakers. We're kind of getting down the weeds and I'm getting ahead of the curve on Dave. But um, it is, I would call it both art and science on underbucking. The art of it is, is you have to figure out what works with your body dynamics, your ergonomics, um, where you're strong, if you're strong in your shoulders, if you're not strong in your shoulders, um, but most importantly, your ability to communicate with the Sawyer across from you. Just, just like top bucking, bottom bucking is only as efficient as your ability to work as a team. Um, and it's, you're, you're not at the mercy of the fastest Sawyer, you're at the mercy of the, of the, of the, of the rhythm that is most comfortable for both. Um, so, and obviously under bucking creates, you know, you know creates a different kind of fatigue than top bucking. Um, uh, well, I think they will be talking about some of the tools that can help with underbucking, particularly single man underbucking, but yeah, it's, um, it's a learned art for sure. And that's the one piece we can't do here on Zoom is, is help you start to establish that muscle memory. It sounds like a lot of you have already used saws before. So I think most of you know what we're talking about, but those of you who don't, 
you'll learn that there's a stark difference between bottom bucking when you have to when you have to cut in the bottom and you've got so much um, uh, compression on the top that if you try to cut in the top, it's going to bind your saw and you have to underbuck. It's just a different it's a different operation. So Bill, a lot of appreciation in the chat for the conversation on um, bucking instead of just falling. So folks are getting a lot out of this. Also, if you folks are kind of following the chat, there's folks in there that know they need practice and they're looking for somebody to pick them up as a volunteer just to uh, work with them this summer. So um, so somebody missed yesterday's session, but wants to know physical technique. Did you already talk about the physical techniques that um, are addressed? I, how you actually work the equipment, how you run a saw, that sort of thing. That's actually going to be a little bit as much as we can cover in a Zoom environment in the days ahead. Now, okay. yes, yesterday, if you missed yesterday, um, I apologize. You, you're probably going to have to wait to get um, a letter from us until you've seen all four sessions. But yesterday was sort of about OLEC, which we've sort of reviewed a little bit today, uh, which is you know, how you sort of think through um, your operations on the ground. What is our objective? You know, what are the hazards? What's the lean? Or in the case of bucking stuff that's already down, uh, what are the binds? You know, what are the escape plans? Because um, even even in a bucking operation, you have to have you know, think about an escape plan and felling. Uh, it's just as critical to have an escape plan and bucking because you don't know how that release is going to go, um, and then putting together that cut plan. So that's that, and we spent a lot of time on how the brain functions yesterday. So that's what you missed is is making sure you stay in that logical, rational part of your brain and not get into the fight and flight mode of, of starting to make decisions because you're trying to undo something that didn't go as planned, um, that sort of thing. Another couple questions about wedges, but I understand that wedges are gonna be covered maybe tomorrow? Yeah, well, I think, I think Dave, you're gonna cover wedging a little bit or do you wanna talk about it a little bit today? I can talk about it a little bit. Yeah, no, I can jump into that here for just a minute. Sure. Uh, yeah, so with wedging, you, you know, uh, if you know you're going to be using wedges uh, to any great extent, uh, make sure you bring enough and you bring different shapes and sizes too. There's there's never one that's going to fit every condition you run across. So uh, with wedging, you want to make sure that you're not going to use really hardened steel wedges except uh, in very specific situations. So you want to use magnesium or aluminum wedges. Um, if you need to use a metal wedge, um, otherwise you want to use plastic wedges, ideally plastic wedges. And whenever you're using crosscut saws, you want to make sure that your wedge is a uh, is a very really, uh, shallow profile. You don't want a real steep um, steep surface to to the wedge uh, because your curve is so small with a crosscut saw. So, uh, and whenever you're using wedges, you want to make sure that you're putting in the wedge as quick as you can. Uh, crosscut saws are pretty tall compared to a, uh, a chainsaw bar. And the quicker you can get that wedge in there, the, the easier your life's going to be as you continue to complete your, your operation. Sometimes Dave, Dave's going to cover the type of saws, um, type tooth patterns, that sort of thing, including the difference between a felling and bucking saw. But a lot of times for bucking operations, uh, felling saws are great because they're, they're narrower, uh, they have the concave back and, and uh, it'll allow you to get a wedge in uh, sooner. Uh, I will very much caution you against going crazy with your wedges and driving them too deep when the saw's in there. Um, seen lots of saws screwed up by people driving the wedge right into the saw, um, which will damage the saw significantly. Um, another wedge technique and type of wedge that you may hear about, and we talked about twisting fibers earlier when the when when this is twisting, the fibers twisting and the log may want to roll um, as you're releasing fibers is using hanging wedges, uh, which actually go across the kerf, not in the kerf, um, and would keep that um, in theory hold that twisting action from from happening once you get them established. Um, and I'm assuming that that might be a little bit of part of it as Dave goes through the different elements of the saw work, the tools and equipment, but hanging wedges are, uh, you know, putting, putting them across the curve instead of in the curve, if that makes sense. Fun comment in the chat says two to use, two to lose, and two to break. 
So that's maybe how many you need. <laughs> that's about um, right. Question is, what is everyone's preferred lubricant or solvent? Do you have any ideas on that, Bill? Uh, I prefer not petroleum based for in the wilderness, just from being a bit of a wilderness snob. Um, but I'll be the first to admit I use some WD-40 uh, sometimes, but also some of the citrus based stuff um, as well. Um, but curious what Dave and Pete, what they think are the best lubricants. Phones on, Dave or Pete, you want to jump in there? Yeah, so with uh, I do like using citrus based. It cuts well. The the one thing that you want to watch out for when you're using citrus based is you want to clean it off your saw as quick as you can um, after you use it, uh, because it will itch the saw. Um, and our saws are old; we need to take care of them. So, uh, but citrus based is is very effective. All right. Anything else? I'm not. One more question in the chat. Is there a good source for low angle wedges? Um, seems like they recently had a problem for high angle wedges popping out when they tried to drive them in. Yeah, so the best thing for that is to buy nice long wedges and then um, cut them cut them down to size that's, uh, that's functional for you to transport and use. Uh, so you buy a 12 inch wedge and cut it down to eight inches. And that's one of the best ways I found to, uh, to have that nice limb profile. I will tell you some wedges that I have been in love with um, for a while that are um, the aluminum wedges, which are from a company called Little Town, Little Town Foundry, I think in Pennsylvania. Uh, fairly lightweight. Um, I found them to be about the right angle. Um, and they're actually pretty affordable. The, actually, it's the cost of shipping that sometimes is almost as much as the wedges. So we used to order them in bulk and bring them to the Wilderness Skills Institute there in the Southern Appalachians and I would sell out of the box and most of the folks who had bought them before would come back for more because of yeah as somebody said earlier two to two to use two to lose uh, you know keep track of those wedges in the field um, somebody should be responsible for them if if you know you're supposed to have two wedges in your pack when you leave a operation make sure you have two wedges in your pack it's easy for that stuff to disappear into the understory if you're not careful. So a lot of information in the chat from folks about what they prefer for solvents and lubricants. Um, you might want to read that from grinding wax to beeswax, um, some things that aren't liquid, um, an idea about how they seal the saws after they clean them. So really good information in there. Uh, there is one last question. Someone wants to know that if, if they're not able to make one of these four courses this week, but they do watch the recording, could they receive credit for the course? Um. Yeah, I, it might, might be that I might be willing to have a conversation with them just to make sure that um, I guess we're trusting everybody that you didn't log in and then walk away from your computer. Um, uh, so attendance is uh, is sort of on the honor system here, but I think I don't want to speak for Pete, but um, I think we'd be okay with that if you you know send us an email, maybe acknowledge in your email, here's what was covered, here's what you know, just a quick few lines about that you did watch the content. Again, we're not certifying you. You, you are not going to leave Friday's course ready to go to the woods. You're going to have to go through field certification. And if you haven't paid attention in this, or, or you say you've watched one of these segments and you haven't, and I'm not saying any of you would do this, I'm just saying you're going to have to go through the training. And if you've not captured some of what we went through today, that probably would come out in your field certification. Right. We have about five minutes left for questions. Um, anything else for our instructors? Looks like Pete's got something. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, there is a field portion to this, and um, you're going to have to go through that. And um, that's where the, you know, the, um, it, it, um, it hits the road, you know, you're going to have to show your instructor that that you've picked up on the concepts that we've taught here um, this week. And, um, and then they'll, when they think you're ready for an evaluation, they'll, they'll put you through the evaluation. And again, um, the evaluation is a performance based um, uh, test, if you will. And um, either either you you know what you're doing or, or you don't or you have a good day or um, or a bad day. So um, 
yeah, it's, uh, it is an honor system. Um, again, we're just teaching you the concepts here. It's when you get out in the field that you actually put them into practice. Sounds good. Um, there is a comment and Bill did put his email in there if you need to contact him about a course. Um, someone said, oh, it's, yeah, Eric, can we put together a list of resources that captures these comments and tips? And Bill, if you save the chat, I'm willing to do that. And maybe we could upload a document tomorrow that has those, um, those things that people are using as far as solvents and yeah, like sure. that. And well, just a we'll comment that says you're already certified as bee bucking chainsaw and cross the cut, but that this class has been of great benefit to them. So awesome. I appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, I, I thought I thought I had the sense that there were some people who have been on a solid time or two in this course, which is great. <laughs> Just appreciate it. It's, it's always good. I mean, it's good for me to have to go through the process of putting together the presentation to remind myself of, of all of this stuff. You know, we a lot of us have to go multiple months without being able to pull on a saw because of the seasons in our in our locales. But um, yeah, it's always good to get refreshed on this stuff. And, and I will tell you a great way to become an even more efficient Sawyer is to strive to become an instructor, try, strive to become a C because there's nothing to help ingrain the stuff in your brain like actually having to share it with people in a logical fashion. So hopefully I found a way to at least come close to that today. Great job. Really nice comments in the chat. 